Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Botti in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 23rd, and here are some of the stories we are covering. U.S. First Lady Jill Biden begins second day of her visit to Namibia today, Thursday. She arrived at the National Airport where she was met by the First Lady of Namibia, Monica Genkos, and the Deputy Prime Minister, Netumbo Nandi Daitwa. It was a warm occasion where they observed some cultural dances. Guinea's military leader promises to step down as head of the transition by 2024. Liberia says its population rose to 5 million. Dry conditions to continue over the Horn of Africa from March to May rainy season. Is there a possibility of a runoff in Saturday's presidential election in Nigeria? This as all 18 presidential candidates sign a peace accord. If the elections are conducted in line with the rules and the law, of course, we are peace loving party. We will respect the will of the people. We expect the other political parties who have that commitment. And Ukrainians settle into life in Poland one year after fleeing Russian invasion. Those stories plus our Black History Month and African History Facts for today, February 23rd, are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Biden on Wednesday made the first visit by a U.S. First Lady to the southwestern African nation of Namibia, chosen, she said, because of its vibrant democracy. The nation's president and First Lady warmly welcome her as Biden, who has visited Africa several times before, began a five-day two-nation trip to the continent. Viewers Anita Powell reports from the capital, Vinhoek. When asked why she chose Namibia, an arid, sparsely populated southern African nation, as the first stop on what the White House says is a show of support and respect for Africa, First Lady Jill Biden did not hesitate. We wanted to come because, uh, you know, this is a young democracy, and we want to support democracies around the world. And um, we met each other in December, and we're just continuing the relationship. And Monica and I, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that we became good friends instantly. That friend, Namibian First Lady Monica Gangos, agreed. Madam First Lady, what do you hope to show uh, Dr. Biden on her trip here? What, what's important to you? There's a lot in Namibia that uh, we'd really like to show Dr. Biden. I know it's her first visit uh, to Namibia. I know it's the first time an incumbent American First Lady has come to the country. And I think what she talked about is very true. Um, it is a very vibrant democracy. We've got a very large youth population who drives that democracy very energetically, um, and it's fully enabled by our constitutional values, but also by the personal values of our, of our leadership. Uh, he may not look at, but he's really the ultimate uh, Democrat. Biden is the first White House official to visit the country after President Joe Biden last year pledged to send administration officials to the continent. She follows Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who made trips to Africa earlier this year. Thomas Greenfield focused part of her visit around the food security crisis in East Africa, something Biden plans to highlight when she visits Kenya later this week. But these high-profile visits are also happening against the background of increased visits by top-level Russian and Chinese officials to the continent. Gangos' husband, President Hage Geingob, waited alone in a foyer while the two first ladies were entertained below by dancers from the Nama, Oshivambo, and Swana people who ululated and danced in a flurry of leopard print, white beads, and deer pelts. One of them dyed hot pink. VOA asked the president what he thought of the unprecedented visit. We are very happy and honored to receive the first lady from the United States. It's a great honor to have you. While the nation is a multi-party democracy, the same party, Kangob Southwest Africa People's Organization, has led since the nation won independence more than three decades ago. That liberation struggle pulled on other parts of the globe for support. Earlier Wednesday, Biden laid a wreath at Heroes Acre, a memorial to those who fought for the nation's independence. That memorial, with its brutalist sculpture and wide expanses of stone, bears an uncanny similarity to the Heroes Acre in Zimbabwe's capital, maybe because both memorials were built by the same North Korean company. And that same firm built the imposing modernist gray cement State House, where Biden was so warmly, colorfully received by the first couple. Biden plans to visit a U.S.-funded project in the Capitol on Thursday that focuses on empowering women and children and to lunch with Gaingos. Then she heads to Kenya on Friday, where she will use her popularity and platform to draw attention to women's empowerment, 
children's issues, and the hunger crisis that is, again, ravaging the Horn of Africa. Anita Powell, VOA News, Bintuk, Namibia. U.S. First Lady Jill Biden continues her visit to Namibia today, Thursday. Earlier, I spoke with journalist Vitalio Angula in the Namibian capital, Vinhawk, about Jill Biden's visit. She arrived at the national airport. It's called the Hosea Kotako International Airport, where she was met by the First Lady of Namibia, Monica Genkos, and the Deputy Prime Minister of Namibia, Netumbo Nandi Daitwa. It was a warm um, occasion with a lot of people in attendance where they observed some cultural dances before they drove off to the Heroes Acre for laying down of wreaths. The Heroes Acre is Namibia's monument for the heroes who died during the colonial struggle for freedom and independence. So what what is on her agenda according to the officials there? What, What are some of the things she's supposed to be doing? According to the press release, on her agenda for today, there will be, from the Heroes Acre, they will be going to the State House. Tomorrow, she'll be visiting uh, Katutura, which is a, a township in Vintuk, where the majority of uh, the low-income earners live. She will be talking to young girls in terms of uh, programs for women's empowerment, access um, to health care, and access to basic uh, goods and social services such as water and electricity. On Friday, uh, she would also be talking to the students at the Namibia University of Science and Technology. You mentioned uh, the focus also on women empowerment. What can you tell us about Namibia's uh, successes, I would say, or programs in women empowerment? Namibia is only second uh, to Uganda on the African continent in terms of women representation in the National Assembly, that is in the Parliament. And this is a significant stride. Also, the majority of women are lawmakers who are drafting laws. These are laws that speak to the Divorce Act, the Rape Act, uh, Domestic Violence Act, and Child Care and Protection Act. I just wanted to mention also the person uh, who received Dr. Biden, Monica Genkos, who is the first lady of Namibia, has actually also played a vital role in speeding up some of those acts. And in Namibia, we have a, a problem of teenage pregnancy, whereby in some regions you find a teenage pregnancy uh, prevalence of 19%, but in other regions you find as high as 33%. So these are the things that the First Lady through her Be Free organization have actually been addressing throughout the years. Vitalio, thank you so much uh, for your time speaking with us. Uh, We do appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. That was journalist Vitalio Angular speaking with us from the Namibian capital, Vinhook. Nigerians go to the polls this Saturday to elect a new president and members of parliament. Yesterday, Wednesday, all 18 presidential candidates signed an accord organized by the National Peace Committee in the presence of President Muhammadu Buhari. The agreement pledges that they will be peaceful during Saturday's vote. Debo Ologunamba is the National Publicity Secretary of Nigeria's main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP. He tells me that the party and its presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, have always been peace-loving and will respect the accord. It's a body called the Peace Council in Nigeria, and it's made up of very prominent Nigerians, former head of state, the head of the, the Christian community, the Muslim community, church in uh, communication, media houses, owners, and they came out in the committee. And they said there must be an engagement of the uh, peaceful contest candidates to have an understanding that they need to maintain peace before during and after the election. That committee has been existing. The number of data are body, and of course, well respected Nigerian, and they have been doing in every uh, election cycle. And they have it in two parts. Just before the commencement of campaign, we signed the first part, and, and this is the concluding part of that uh, endeavor. So the Peace Council, the agreement that will be signed by the major party, the candidate of the party, to make commitment to a peaceful process in the electoral process before the beginning, during, and of course, clearly after the elections. Does that mean that uh, whoever wins or loses will accept the result? Well, I can't speak for all the parties, but what happened is this. We have a record. We are a People's Democratic Party, and we have demonstrated that over the years. 
In 2015, when we lost the election, we accepted even before when Kato was still going on. Our president then, President Goodlord Jonathan, considered defeat and congratulated the party. And so that's a culture of respecting the will of the people. As a PDP, we expect that if the elections are conducted in line with the rules and the law, of course, we are peace-loving party. We are democratic in our process. And to that extent, of course, we will respect the will of the people. That is our commitment as a party. We expect the other members, other political parties who will have that commitment. Thank you very much and good luck on Saturday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Coming from you, I take it with my two hands. Debo Olugunaba is the National Publicity Secretary of Nigeria's main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP. He was speaking with us from Abuja. Is there a possibility of a runoff in Saturday's presidential election in Nigeria? Carol Castillo, the director of VOA's current affairs program, discusses that scenario with Peter Lewis, the chair of African Studies at the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and Ebenezer Obadere, senior fellow in African Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. First, Peter Lewis tells Carol that while the odds do not seem to favor Peter Obi, he still has a path to victory. My hunch is that there's likely to be a runoff. I was talking to somebody, and I think they gamed it out correctly. If there's a runoff between Obi and Atiku, Obi wins or has a definite chance of winning. If there's a runoff between Obi and Tinubu, Tinubu is likely to win. And there's a lot of regional politics (laughs) that are involved in that and a lot of sectional strategies. I won't bore you with with the details, but the Constitution is very clear on this point, and most people seem to overlook Mm. it. But where you have more than two candidates, you have to achieve a plurality. That's all that's required. So if if Obi gets his 37%, which is what he's polling at now, and he gets more than 25% of the vote in two-thirds of the states, 24 states, which means he doesn't have to win those states. He just has to get 25%. He could be declared the winner. I think that's a pretty high bar because the way he's polling in the northern states is in single digits. And Tanubu has allegiance in the Southwest. So Obi would have to get really lucky to yeah. clear the bar in the first vote. But if Tanubu and Atiku come in behind on the absolute number of votes, if it's 29% and, you know, 20% or something like that, mm-hmm. even if they have the spread, it goes to a runoff. And so I think it's on the edge. I agree with Ebenezer's analysis, and we're seeing the same fundamentals in terms of legacy, in terms of the weakness of the Labour Party, and the role of youth protest, and so forth. If youth come out in a big way, and there's some indication that they've registered more, and we have higher turnout, you know, again, that could also influence things, too. But I wouldn't count out OB in the sense of gaining out a potential path to victory. So that's just my take. And then Ebenezer, I know you don't think Obi can prevail, but what about a runoff? Do you see a runoff or do you see a clear win for Atiku? No, actually, Peter and I don't disagree. The only thing I will add to what he has said, all of which I agree with is, and I'm sure he's also looking at this as well, I still want to see how the G5 governors, the renegade, Uh the five renegade governors, I want to see how they play their hand. You know, asking people questions, they are holding their cards to their chest. Whoever they break for will immediately have an edge over the others. That was Ebenezer Obadere, Senior Fellow in African Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Earlier, you heard Peter Lewis, Chair of African Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I am James Butte in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 23rd. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And still to come on our program, our Black History Month Facts of the Day. Guinea Conakry military leader Mamadi Dubuya said at the opening of a consultative conference on a new constitution that he will step down as leader together with his government in 2024. But as Karin Kamara reports from Conakry, ordinary Guineans are skeptical about Dubuya's pronouncement. 
The National Transition Council, a proxy of a National Assembly, is holding a consultative conference here in Conakry on a new constitution slated to be drafted after the meeting. Some political parties, civil society groups, and trade unions are taking part in the conference. They say drafting a new constitution is a prerequisite for a return to democratic rule in the country. Dumboya came to power in September 2021 in a military coup that overthrew Alpha Conde, the country's democratically elected president. The junta says the transition to civilian rule will start next January. The opening ceremony was presided over by junta leader Mamadi Dumboya. The new constitution, he says, will benefit the children of Kini and that he and his government will step down after the transition period ends in 2023. He says the junta is going to manage the transition but will not take part in politics after the transition. And that is clear. He says that the National Transition Council will draft a new constitution, but it is up to Guineans to adopt it through a referendum. The announcement is the first major step by the junta for a return to a democratic rule in Guinea. But for many, 2024 is too far away. Reaction on the street after the junta leaders promised to step down next year was mixed. He asked with whom did he speak before deciding to step down in 2024. Did he speak with opposition or someone else? He says he does not trust Dumbuya and that the country is not going well. Nothing is working and the cost of basic food items has increased. He says that the month of Ramadan is approaching and he is worried. Aminata Jello is a school teacher and she is skeptical about the junta leader's announcement. She says they are watching the Mbuya, but do not have confidence in him because this is a military issue. She says at the moment nothing happening in the country. Things are expensive and no one understands what is going on. The junta leader's announcement comes as the economic community of West African State and the African Union have decided to maintain sanctions on the country. ECOWA says in the near future, it will impose individual sanctions on members of the junta. Guinea's Prime Minister Bernard Gomu has accused Umaru Mbalo Sisoko, the chairman of ECOWAS and president of neighboring Guinea-Bissau, of turning other heads of state against the military government. Umaru Mbalo is opposed to the two and a half year transition period set by the junta. He says it's too long and that junta must go as quickly as possible. Reporting for VOA Africa, I am Karim Kamara in Conakry. Liberia says its population has grown by 3.3% in the last 15 years. The country says it now has a population of 5.2 million people as of February 22nd, following the release of its latest population and housing census. A census in 2008 reported that the country had a population of 3.7 million people. Moses Gazia will report from Monrovia. We are pleased to report to you Liberia's population as at now is 5,248,621. That's Lauren George, acting head of the Liberia Institute of Statistics and Geoinformation Services, or LIGES, announcing the provisional results of the national population in housing census. The stars come four years from the actual census period as part of the constitution. It was expected that the official count who have been conducted in 2018, but it did not take place until 2022. George says there were uncontrollable factors that led to the delay. The project which was slated to be undertaken in 2018 was delayed due to several factors, including but not limited to the national governance transition in 2018 and the global COVID-19 pandemic in 2019 amongst other the implementation of the census faced serious challenges in 2022 that resulted in a change of leadership at Bleaches and a resolution from the legislature to allow the process to be conducted in phases. Lawrence George says, despite these challenges, the best digital tools were used to count the population. As a comprehensive digital census, it leveraged the available technology to improve efficiency in its operations and enhance the quality of the data collected. 
According to the report, males make up 50.4% of the population, while females account for 49.6% with a national sex ratio of 101.5 males for every 100 females. Masuala County, which includes the capital Monrovia, again remains the most populous region in Liberia. This was Liberia's fifth national housing and population census since the first was conducted in 1960. Experts say this is the first digital version to be conducted by the country. Liberia's Vice President Joel Howard Taylor wants the government and partners to leverage the opportunities associated with conducting the digital census. I pray that our government and our partners will now begin to look at how we can synchronize all of the issues that we give each one, one digital footprint to be used in every area, whether it's a driver's license or photos registration or a passport, this provides unlimited possibilities. Liberia receives support from a host of bilateral and multilateral partners, including the United Nations. The United Nations Population Fund plays a major role in assisting the country with robust technical support during the conduct of the census. Meanwhile, the Liberia Institute of Statistics and Joint Information Services says the results released are preliminary and constitute 97 percent of the total data counted. However, there are key elements that are not listed or announced, which include the number of young people in the country. The report will inform Liberia's development and political decision on when is approved by the legislature in the next three months. For VOA News, I'm Moses Gazo in Morovia. The Horn of Africa, and specifically East Africa, will experience severe drought in the next three months as the rainy season is projected to fall. This, according to the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Climate Prediction and Application Center, which says there shall be below normal rainfall in most parts of the region. In an ongoing meeting in Nairobi, Kenya, IGAD says East African countries are staring at a dry season that could result in drought, food insecurity, and diseases. Maureen Ojiambo reports. East Africa is projected to experience severe drought that is due to projected below normal rainfall between the months of March and May. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, says the situation will affect Kenya, Somalia, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and South Sudan. In a meeting in Nairobi yesterday, Wednesday, IGAD's Climate Prediction and Application Center, ICPSC, said that the rains from March to May contribute to up to 60% of the total annual amount in the equatorial parts of the Great Horn of Africa. Gladaton is the IGAD's Climate Prediction and Application Center director. Food insecurity in the region will not be exacerbated only by climate change or weather uh, variabilities, but there are other factors as well, such as socioeconomic impacts, insecurity and conflicts, and others. So there is also a farming condition might be experienced considering high acute food insecurity case loads in the region. It's been already projected in some parts of Somalia. The Food Security and Nutrition Working Group estimates that close to 23 million people are at the moment food insecure in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia. Eunice Koech is a climate modeling assistant at IGAD's Climate Prediction and Applications. She says the region may not have a good harvest for the coming season, especially for the maize crops. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Giombo in Sacramento, California. And here now are our African-American and African history facts for today, February 23rd. On this day in 1868, William Edward Bogart Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. His mother raised him on her own, instilling in him the values of hard work and education. William did well in high school and got a scholarship to Fisk University. He also attended Harvard University and became the first African-American to get a doctoral degree from Harvard. One of Du Bois's achievements was the formation of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, the NAACP. He also helped to educate America about the challenges facing black people. But some criticized him for speaking only for the educator. Du Bois became discouraged about what he called 
director the American situation and took up citizenship in Ghana in 1963. And that's it for this Thursday, February 23rd edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guest this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Barton, Washington, saying have a great day.